Welcome to State of the Art Southern Illinois, a podcast by the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. Our guest today is Susie Bogus. Listen as we discuss her musical influences, the music in her life growing up, and her path to success as a musician in Nashville. So if you're ready to go. I am here. Susie, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So you're coming to the Marion Cultural and Civic Center uh, August 27th. We're so excited to have you here. Um, thank you. I'm excited to play there finally. We've been uh, trying to get this done for a couple of years <laughs> since yeah, the, I had, uh, the shutdown there. <laughs> we had the shutdown and then there was a my, my wife is a principal of an elementary school here in town and one of the teachers at her school has been adamant for about three years about getting you here. Oh, that's She very saw nice. you, I think, I down in that. Anna Jonesboro one day. Oh, um, okay. And, and she said, you have to get Susie in here. And I said, I'll work on it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think it was the storytellers uh, mm -hmm. thing that we did there, at, which is, you know, really, it's a really cool festival. Awesome. Well, Susie, let's start at the beginning. Um, was there a lot of like music in your house growing up or, or what was your family like life? Um, well, I had, uh, you know, there was six of us, I'm four kids and my parents and uh, yeah, I was exposed to a lot of music as a child. We had a piano when I was first, you know, when I was really little and then uh, my folks, uh, I think they, gave that away and we got an organ after that and so we had that and my brother had a guitar and um you know it just seemed like everybody loved to sing uh, you know we all sang in the church choir and my mom was a very you know uh big part of the church choir for many years so uh, all of us started at a really young age and and kept it up all the way till we went away to school so and at that point, did you see music as a profession growing, you know, as you were growing up, or did you just see it as something that your family did? No, I really didn't. I, I it was just for fun and for, a lot that, you know, created a lot of joy in our house. You know, with four kids, you can imagine that if we were doing something together, it was, <laughs> it was good if it was something that we were uh, all enjoying and not fighting over or whatever. So that was... Um, something good and and we uh had a record player just a plain old record player and and uh everybody kind of had their own records and so i was exposed since i'm the youngest uh i was exposed to lots of different kinds of music my folks liked the more kind of you know uh i think they call it classic pop you know we had things like dean martin and uh oh, we had Ella Fitzgerald and we had some, you know, Ferrani and Teicher and that kind of stuff. Um, and then my oldest brother was really into the harmony, uh, four part harmony things like the Four Seasons and, and that kind of music. My sister was the James Taylor, Carol King uh, person. And then my closest brother, um, uh, he loved like, uh, Credence Clearwater and Arlo Guthrie and kind of, you know, just a, everybody had a slightly different um, taste. So I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of music. And my dad, when, once the uh, eight tracks came into play, uh, my dad had eight tracks of country music in the car because he worked at International Harvester and he would carpool with his buddies and they all liked country music. and. My mom kind of didn't want it in the house, <laughs> which was kind of funny because now she's such a big fan. But back then it was sort of, I don't know if she just, you know, it was always just to, to real life or something for her, I think. That's what, So throughout your childhood, obviously exposed to tons of different instruments, styles. Um, yep. And so you you go on and you go off to college are you focusing in music focusing on music or in music in any way whenever you head off to college 
Yeah, um, I, you know, when I was in high school, I started to uh, really get into guitar, and I even taught lessons, you know, in in uh, our little living room, you know, just the, I didn't, I wasn't really like a great teacher, but I could teach people the basics, all the notes of the guitar, and and chords, and how to keep a rhythm, because I played the drums in the school band, so, um, so I did that, you know, for, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pretty much the last three years of high school, I guess. And uh, so I really loved it. And, you know, when I got to college, there were just so many other people who, I, in fact, my dorm was all arts. Yeah, the dorm was either you were um, a theater major, an art major, or a music major. And I was an art major. So uh, I was exposed then again to lots of different stuff because some of the gals, I, you know, I grew up in a really small town. Um, you know, it's 3,000 people, but, and we are the county seat, but, uh, but the, uh, you know, the, you know, the, a lot of the folks at Illinois Wesleyan were um, from Chicago and had sung with, up with people and done all this stuff. And I auditioned for the University Singers and got into that um, as one of the, the two altos. So that was um, pretty cool for me. Uh, and I learned a lot about, I'd, I'd done musicals and stuff in high school and stuff, but I learned a lot about, um, you know, choreographed, uh, how to put on a show, basically, that wasn't uh, uh, an actual musical. So that was, that was a cool experience for me. You mentioned musicals in high school. What was your favorite character you played in high school? Oh, let's see. I played Meg Brocky in Brigadoon. I loved that one because I loved the comedy part of it. Um, and I, I did play Nancy and Oliver, so that was kind of fun too because I got to be a little more dramatic. And uh, you know, I, I liked doing the accents. I for some reason I I really enjoyed doing the accents. Not that I was good at it, but it was fun. Oh yeah. And so. You went to Wesleyan, but you didn't end up staying at Wesleyan, correct? Right. I, I actually transferred to Illinois State after one year at Wesleyan, uh, largely because uh, one of the my dorm mates or whatever uh, uh, ex showed me jewelry that she had made out of silver, and uh, she'd done that in high school, uh, living up close to Chicago, and I was an art major already, and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if I could um, major in metals? So I could do that at Illinois State University. So I transferred over there and got into that program, and uh, did a, I did a lot of uh, lithography as well. I, I enjoyed both of those a lot. So. And so did you end up graduating with a, a metalsmithing degree? Uh, basically, it's just an art degree with a concentration in metals, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess technically I did. That's really cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a good thing to have if so you could fall back on it. I used to make jokes all the time about how, um, you know, it's working with metal is a lot like the music business, you know, because you're always getting cut and hurt and <laughs> burned. <laughs> <laughs> So during your time at ISU, uh, were you doing anything musically um, that would kind of set you up for what you wanted, what you ended up doing in the music world after that? Well, when I was at Wesleyan, um, some of my friends uh, were playing out in like coffee house type places. And I, I did my first coffee house performance at uh, at Wesleyan, but then I found out that you could actually get paid to play downtown in a little place in Normal called the Gallery. And so I started out singing there for seven bucks and all the beer and pizza I could hold. So that, sounds that was like actually, a great deal. it was a, it was a great deal. You can't imagine how much of that other stuff I can hold. So <laughs> 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 was, they might, they might should have uh, said, you just get all the beer and pizza you want. Um, so, so you did that, and then after you got out of 
after you graduated from ISU, where did your career take you at that point? You know, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's, I, I started really getting into performing and I was kind of understanding how to book myself and things like that. So little by little, by performing at the gallery, then I started playing in some other places. I joined the music union uh, in Bloomington and uh, I just kind of, I really enjoyed trying to work myself into the next be best gig. And I would get people that would come in and say, oh, we're having a bar mitzvah or we're having a wedding or an anniversary party or something like that. So I ended up buying a PA system uh, with a little uh, drum track thing that you could work on your, with your feet. So, <laughs> so I'd set it up to, you know, whether it was a waltz or a samba or whatever the heck. And then, uh, you know, I'd play that, I'd, kick the button and then start playing the songs and uh, learned had to learn a lot of different styles to be able to do all different kinds of gigs and uh, eventually I started going up and working around the Chicago area uh, just from meeting people and finding out I played in a Greek restaurant where on my on my uh, breaks there was a belly dancer and she made a lot more tips than I did so <laughs> You know, I did some interesting things, but there was a point when I was a senior in college that my my jewelry professor was like, you know, would, you're not in the studio enough anymore. You know, are you seriously going to be a jeweler, or uh, you know, are you going to you know do be doing medals for art, or are you going to be a singer? And I kind of just broke down and said, I I really think I'm going to be a singer. So. He was really sweet to me, and I felt like at that point he, you know, he really kind of just wanted me to say it to myself so that I could, you know, get on with doing that. So I actually missed my graduation because I had a gig <laughs> in Davenport, Iowa, and I had gone over there and found an apartment, and I got a six night a week uh, job playing there. And it was for more money than I'd ever seen in my life, you know, to be working six nights a week. It was just, it was a, just a really great experience and real, um, because it was, um, it was a hotel that had a bar that was a, like a really nice bar. And so playing four or five sets a night and doing that just like one night after another, I really had to have a lot of materials. So. You know, I had a couple of hundred songs that I would just, you know, be able to pull from. And, and this is before, you know, you had your um, tablet in front of you or any notes. So you, I just remembered 200 songs at a time. Mm -hmm. And it was good experience, you know, really had to um, buckle down and, and learn a lot of stuff. And people would come into that place that also played and uh, we had an open mic on Monday nights and um, you know after the open mic we would sit around and play and I learned more about guitar and um, you know eventually I started trying to book myself into Chicago into some of the folk clubs up there and up into uh, Madison and uh, oh gosh, I've worked uh, in Minneapolis, you know, just kind of around the college areas where they had coffee houses and places that were listening rooms. So from, from playing that uh, and, you know, kind of traveling and, and playing hundreds and hundreds of songs, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that gave you an opportunity to really like hone a, a, performance presence and 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 be you know they they say that you know uh, Malcolm Malcolm Gladwell gives the 10,000 hours and that really gave you the time to put in to to hone yourself as an artist to play in front of people it totally did and you know it's I, I don't I can't say how things actually happen but through you know people that were all like-minded that were doing the troubadour thing. Um, I started hearing about things where you could go to a college seminar thing and they, there would be uh, representatives from a bunch of the Midwestern colleges. And so then you would get hired or, you know, not, 
<laughs> but you get hired for some, you get some gigs out of it. And then that would sort of route me, you know, up into Wisconsin mm -hmm. or up into Minnesota or over into Iowa. And a lot of times the university um, would have a radio station and you'd get an, an interview at the radio station to plug the show that night. And, and uh, you know, eventually I just sort of started making a little bit of a name for myself and, the, um, you know, and getting confidence. I bought a camper truck, you know, the dog, mm -hmm. the camper truck, had the whole thing. <laughs> and then I started working um, out west. I, you know, kind of used what I had honed to, um, to get myself around to so I could see more parts of the country. And so I started working in ski resorts and that sort of thing. Started out doing summertime uh, with a friend of mine that was a school teacher. And then um, eventually I would go back in the winter with another friend of mine and we would play in the ski resorts uh, during the ski season. So, it, you know, it all just kind of led to me getting, uh, you know, enough chops and writing some songs and getting to the place where I, I was ready to move to Nashville. And was it when you moved to Nashville that you ended up connecting with the record label? Or was that prior? Yeah. No, it was after I moved to Nashville. I actually worked, um, as soon as I got here, I, I had a friend that was working at a place called Tony Roma's, which is a chain of rib joints. And uh, it was kind of right down around Vanderbilt University and kind of in a kind of rock block kind of place. And so I was fortunate enough to be working three nights a week there and paying my rent that way. And a lot of people came through there, um, a lot of people in, that um, were working in the recording studios in Nashville because it was just a few blocks away. And, you know, I just started meeting people and I started working as a demo singer, which is where you go in the studio and a songwriter maybe he wants to pitch the song to Reba McIntyre, so he wants to have a female voice on it. Or, uh, or a lot of times uh, the songwriters just didn't sing. So they, you know, they wanted somebody that could kind of, you know, that they knew could carry the song so that they could pitch it to uh, um, artists that weren't writing their own material. And so I started doing that for a couple of the you know, bigger studios uh, and bigger publishing companies. And during that time is when I got hired at Dollywood. So, mm. um, so I'd been in Nashville for about a year when I um, got hired to open the park. It was the first season that Dollywood was open. And that was 1986. And so that was another just like huge launching board and a huge experience for me. I mean, Dolly was there. I got to open some shows for her. Um, I just learned a tremendous amount uh, about, I'd never worked with a band, only with sitting in with friends. And so I was, uh, I did four shows at the train station with my guitar. And then I did, um, I did the big, Jamboree show at the end, which was an hour and a half show, and I was the female lead in that. So I learned to work with a full band behind me and dancers and every, you know, with cloggers and everything else going on on stage and did a comedy routine with the, the comedian there. And um, so, you know, it was great experience. And Dolly was there and right when mm -hmm. um, Capitol Records came to see me there. Um, and I, just, you know, I asked her if that seemed like a good record deal because they, they basically offered me a record deal <coughs> after seeing me perform there. So, um, so it was kind of like the same day. It was really wild. But um, wow. I, uh, yeah, they came to see me at the train station first and then they came to the Jamboree show and they, then they, they wanted to take me out to dinner and we had these really elaborate costumes at Dollywood that you like my, my dress at, the Jamboree show was like this space material that was all, you know, it was like, you know, what a space blanket looks like, or it's real shiny and, and had ruffles all over the place. And, and, um, all I had was just a pair of 
terry cloth shorts and a man's shirt or that dress to wear to dinner with the Capitol representatives. So I ended up wearing the shorts and just, you know, it fortunately they were really down to earth and really nice people and it, uh, it didn't uh, <laughs> blow the deal for me. Well, and it gave you an opportunity to present, present yourself as your true self right off the bat. Yes, exactly. That was definitely my true self. <laughs> Um, whenever you were doing the demo singing, were there any tracks that you demoed that got picked up and ended up mainstream? Or do you remember any of them? N not really. Uh -uh. I really was working, um, I was working with a couple of really good songwriters, uh, but I didn't do it long enough because, uh, because I moved over to Dollywood after only being there for a year. So I did get to do quite a bit of the singing and stuff, but I was working with a lot of uh, kind of newbie writers and things, and I, I didn't really, uh, I don't think that I remember anything. Although I did record uh, a song later on that my husband wrote, who was the engineer in the studio at RCA. And um, when I recorded that song, I put it on the album that I sold at Dollywood. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. So, you know, from that point on. And is, we that, is that how you and your speech. husband met is through the re recording in the studio? studio? Yeah, awesome. we met in the studio. And also we played on a volleyball team. <laughs> that was just a bunch of friends that were, some people were in the publishing business and some people were still uh, in the music business program at Belmont. And so, it was just a bunch of young people that liked to play volleyball, and so we kind of got to know each other both in both places. So that's awesome. Um, so after after you got your first record deal with Capitol Records, and um, was was there a certain point in there where you felt like things were really taking off, and and you were really getting embraced in the industry? You know, I f it was very exciting from the, from just even moving there. I just always felt like uh, there was, I, almost every day, I learned something uh, about, you know, what does the producer do? What does the publisher do? I was just learning so much all the time. And I was making friends and my friends were doing well and I was doing well. It just seemed like everything was kind of coming together. Um, when I went to Dollywood, you know, they had a million people come through that park that year. So I had been exposed to a lot of people and uh, got that record deal, um, came back to town and uh, started recording and then everything kind of stopped. It was, it was really slow then. It was like they would, you know, they had what they used to call a developmental deal. And so I would put out one single and that, you know, would maybe be five or six months before I'd know if what was going to happen next. And finally, um, in 1989, they, you know, put me with a producer that was very, um, I don't, we were just a good fit. She was from Los Angeles mm -hmm. and, and had worked a lot with Linda Ronstadt and uh, her dad was a real famous songwriter uh, for television and stuff, and her name was Wendy Waldman. And Wendy and I just really clicked. You know, she she got my kind of folk sensibility mixed with how I loved, I was reverent to the, the kind of more traditional style, but I also had a lot of that California country rock uh, in my soul because I loved the Eagles and Linda Ronstadt and Emmylou Harris. and. So she did a really good job of helping me mix that together. And of course, I'd been out west. I, I did a lot of touring, you know, in, in Colorado and Montana and that. So <laughs> there's two yodeling songs on my first album that I did for Cap Capitol. And the, uh, you know, the A&R folks were a little like, what are we going to do with this? I don't know if radio's going to play <laughs> it, but they... They did embrace a, a couple of songs um, well enough that they, they held on to me. And then the, the fellow who signed me uh, got booted out and they brought in a new um, top dog there, Jimmy Bowen. So, and then, you know, Jimmy and I had a little 
trouble. So I, I, I won the best new female out in California in 89 and then uh, Jimmy and I just had to get to know each other. We made a whole record that basically just didn't even get released. And then um, uh, after that, we kind of, I could tell that it was either I was gonna have to stand up for myself or I might just be, you know, in the black hole of <laughs> country singers, you know? So finally, by, by standing up to him and, you know, sort of saying, hey, if you really want me to do something here, I need your help to find the songs that are really gonna, you know, help me. And so he introduced me to Kim Carnes and he pitched me the song Aces, that was a Cheryl Wheeler song. And uh, that was kind of when I felt like he, he was ready to get me. He, initially he was very, I don't ever want to hear you do that hillbilly yodeling stuff again. And, <laughs> and he was really, uh, you know, just not really understanding the girl with the guitar thing, because most of the performers he had, uh, you know, really brought through and, and I mean, he worked with Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and all these, you know, really biggies out in Los Angeles and, and Kim Carnes and, and, you know, he'd been, he'd kind of been instrumental in breaking Reba and uh, George Strait and stuff. So he really didn't, he wasn't really wanting the, the folk vibe that was underlying in my music. And eventually once he started presenting me with songs and, and writers to to work with, uh, I understood that he was he was going to bend, and I then I bent too. So we ended up doing real well together. Sounds like you hit a great middle ground because, I mean, you put out just a couple of fantastic albums after that. Oh, thanks. Well, he gave me a lot of reins. You know, it's like he he. Basically, I think his motto was basically like, I'll give you enough rope that if you hang yourself, it's your fault, not mine. <laughs> but, uh, but he was really, um, he was really a good guy to work with because you, you were, he didn't want you to, you get, he would pick up the phone anytime if you called, but he also knew that you knew, don't waste my time with something silly. So before mm -hmm. you would go in for a meeting, you would think about, what do I really want to get out of this meeting? What is it that I want him to say yes to? Uh, I made some records in really cool locations. Um, it seemed like I was always having to record in the spring where, when I had you know, hay fever and you know, allergies and stuff. So I did one record in the Bahamas and I did one in California um, at uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think what they call it. It's like a planet, something like that. I can't think what it's called. Uh, but it's where like, uh, you know, lots of big, big records were made. And um, it just, uh, it was really cool to have that vibe there. And, and the place in the Bahamas was the same way. It was a very popular place for people to record and take their whole band there and work it up. and. Um, it just, that, that vibe of kind of having your little team and just really being kind of sequestered and, and working in a studio like that, that was, um, that was fantastic. I, I felt really honored that I got to do that stuff. That's, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. You, you keep talking about the yodeling and your folk, your underlying folk tone in those records. And uh -huh. I, throughout the early 90s you were a staple in my household and my my father is nice. a huge fan of yours and Dwight Yoakam's Aww. and both of you have some nice. of that same feel and uh and and so that it, the more that you say that the more it just kind of settles in my mind the the parallels between your music and Dwight Yoakam's music with the yodeling and the and the folk feel to it Right. And I don't know if you know this, but like the first really big tour for me was with Dwight. So, no. so many times. I mean, we did like 90 shows together one summer um, in 92. So this was right after I won the Horizon Award for the CMA. And um, we just did everywhere. We played everywhere. And 
uh, even Canada. And so many times when people come back to a show, if they hadn't seen me in a long time, they'll come to a small theater show or something like that. So many times they will say, I saw you with Dwight Yoakam, you know, at the St. Louis Zoo or whatever, you know, just these, what, um, because we what played a perfect pairing big for a tour. places. It was great yeah. fun. It was great fun. He had a wonderful group of people around him too. So Awesome. And, and I mean, it's the people on a tour that make the tour good or bad. I mean, the shows are the shows, but you spend so much time with the people that you're touring with that, that so much of that determines your experience. Yes, it's very true. It's very true. And, um, and it was funny because, you know, Dwight had really hit it big right before that. And, um, you know, he, he and I were almost in the same class that you, you call it. Um, they, they would do uh, big showcases for the radio people. And they usually would, you know, like each label would get to have like one artist that they would get to exhibit that year. And uh, so I think he was maybe the year before me, but they, they called my class, well, they call it us the, the class of 89. And it was, you know, it was a great class. It was Laurie Morgan and Mary Chapin Carpenter and, oh, you know, Travis Tritt and Alan Jackson. And just, you know, it was, um, there was a lot of people and everybody kind of had their own unique style. And I think that was just like those four or five years in the early 90s were just such an awesome time because Everybody had had different influences that were just underlying in the music they were making, and uh, it was really, really, really fun. So, Susie, what can people expect whenever whenever they come to your show here in Marion? Is it is it a compilation of all of your catalog, and do you have anything that they don't expect? Is what what should they expect whenever they come? Well, one of the things I love doing now, um, especially when you get to play a beautiful facility like yours, um, is I try to encourage people to sing along. So if it's, whether it's a hit or uh, I do a bunch of uh, actual American folk songs out of a, a book and, and a CD that I did for Cracker Barrel a few years ago. Um, and you know, like Shenandoah and that kind of songs, uh, uh, people love to sing Red River Valley. Uh, but I have a real small trio and we make a lot of music. And so it, for me, it's like, I don't think people, when they first see just three people on the stage, know that they're going to get a full blown band. You know, I think, you know, you guys, I'm, I'm sure have had a, uh, experience with bluegrass bands or Alison Krauss or people who don't carry a drummer. But it, you know, it doesn't. You don't necessarily have to have a drummer to have a full band. So. Oh yeah, um, you'll have a full sound. Yeah, and it's you know it's a lot of fun. Uh, we you know do a lot of three part harmonies and uh, we tell bad jokes and uh, my guys are very interesting. They're you know one of them's from Wales and one of them's from Scotland and. Uh, so I always get them to talk on the mic and tell their background and how they got to the States. And, um, they're just, uh, super, super musicians. So, um, uh, yeah, it's just, it's kind of a okay show for all ages too, you know, because we keep it pretty light. Um, I feel like since we were locked down there for a while, I'm trying to, um, make sure that when people get out, they're having a good time and they're having some fun. And, uh, you know, I'm not like, I don't uh, lay down a whole bunch of sad songs on them all at the same time. I can try to keep it moving pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. We've appreciated talking well, to you. thank you. You too, Josh. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting up there. Uh, my next door neighbor from, from uh, before we moved to this house uh, is from right there in, in Fairview. So uh, she is uh, coming up to the show. And, uh, you know, she's been my close friend forever. She, and her husband played with Charlie Daniels for a million years. Um, oh, Robin. Wow. Awesome. I, I don't know. You probably know the Browns. So Bruce Brown yeah. and, and Robin Brown. So. 
So anyway, I'm Wonderful. looking forward to it, and we will see you soon. Thank you for joining us for State of the Art Southern Illinois, a podcast by the Marion Cultural and Civic Center, featuring local artists, artisans, musicians, arts organizations, and arts events in Southern Illinois, as well as touring artists coming to the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. Special thanks to Susie Boggess for her time speaking with us today. Thanks to A.J. Rice, our associate producer. And special thanks to Kevin Olau and Carr for providing this episode's soundtrack. Join us every Thursday morning for a new episode on Facebook, YouTube, or whatever podcast service you prefer. And now for Golden Age by Carve in its entirety. Let the window down, feel the moonlight on your skin. Let the desert. Drive on.